Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, welcome to Didcot Leisure Centre. Uh, my name is Gail Downey. I'm a journalist and filmmaker, and I've been asked as an independent person, I don't work for the NHS, to chair this meeting and a number of other meetings across the county about the public consultation. Uh, a couple of things, just housekeeping, really, first of all. Uh, the fire exit is clearly marked, the man running down there. Uh, don't use the lifts, as they say. Keep going down the stairs. The toilets, I've discovered, just out of here. <coughs> Ladies opposite you, gentlemen, the other way. Um, we are planning to carry on until 12 o'clock, unless you run out of questions by then. And we're going to split the meeting into two parts. One is going to be the panel are going to do a presentation, and you will then be able to ask some questions. The panel will introduce themselves shortly so you know who they are, where they're from, what their responsibilities are. So please do give them some questions. If you feel uncomfortable putting your hand up, uh, we have some lovely volunteers who will go around and give you postcards. You can write your question on a postcard, and I will read it out for you if that's easier. We've also got microphones, although the room's quite small, so you can probably hear me without the microphones. The only reason we're using the microphones is because the audio... So the sound from this consultation is being recorded, not videoed, just the sound is being recorded. So if you can wait until the microphone comes to you, it means your question and, of course, the answer will then be recorded. And uh, should you want to hear back the consultation later, that I think will be on the website. I'm saying, being told, yes, that will be on the website later on. So um, let's uh, crack on with the meeting. Um, the other thing is hearing loop. If anyone needs hearing loop, can you all hear properly? That's all fine. Okay, that's lovely. If there's any difficulty at all, uh, we've got our lovely technical people here, so they will come and sort it out for you. So don't be afraid to let one of the volunteers know or put your hand up, let me know, and we'll sort it out for you. So let's move on. Let's get on to the panel, as I say, who will introduce themselves. We'll, they will then do a short presentation about the proposals and then we'll get on with the questions and answers. We'll then come to the tables where you're sat, and you'll be able to speak to um, NHS staff face-to-face, -face, some who are already at your tables, to go through a number of other questions uh, that have arisen and some questions that they would like you to ask them. So they're very much, it's about listening to what it is, concerns you and what you have to say. So let's start with Peter. So, yes, hi, um, my name is Peter Knight. I'm the Chief Information and Digital Officer at the Oxford University uh, uh, NHS Foundation Trust. Hi, my name is Tony Berendt. I'm the Medical Director at uh, Oxford University Hospitals. I've been an Oxfordshire resident um, off and on since about 1980 when I came here as a medical student, um, went away for a while, came back, um, and have been here working in the Trust, raised my family here, um, and looking forward to talking with you. Hello, I'm Julie Anderson. I'm um, a local GP in Southwest Locality, um, and I'm also clinical director for Southwest Locality with the CCG. Um, I've been with the CCG for three years, and I have portfolio interests in nursing home care, uh, uh, ordinary care homes, dementia, stroke, end of life care. Good morning. Um, uh, my name's Gareth Kenworthy. I'm the director of finance at the CCG. And you'll pick up from my dulcet tones that I wasn't born and bred in Oxfordshire, but I've lived here now for, for around 21 years. Uh, and this year marks my 20th anniversary of working for the NHS. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I understand we did invite the MP, Ed Vasey, uh, to the panel, but he's, he's elsewhere today. So let's move on with the presentation, start with Gareth. Okay. And we'll just find the clicker, which was... Oh, you've got the clicker, sorry. Uh, thank you, Gail. Um, I'm just going to give you uh, a brief introduction about the, the what and the why we're here to talk to you today. Um, we didn't cover the agenda, but I think, well, Gail's, Gail's covered it in her introduction. Um, this first slide deals with the, the what... So in this first phase of our consultation events, we're running from the 16th of January to the 9th of April. And I think this is our fifth uh, public consultation meeting. So we're consulting on a number of specific changes. So these are 
the use of our hospital beds, uh, planned care at the Horton site in the north of Oxfordshire. And by planned care, what we tend to mean is things like outpatient appointments and diagnostics and things like day case surgery, so non-urgent. Um, we're also consulting specifically on acute, acute stroke services in Oxfordshire. And by acute, what we mean is that crucial first four hours when anybody's had a suspected stroke. We're consulting on critical care at the Horton and maternity services at the Horton. Um, now, what we say at the final point at the bottom, we've got a second phase of consultation planned for later this year. So as part of these events, we're more than happy uh, to engage with you and listen to what you have to say about broader healthcare services. Uh, and we'll pick that up in terms of planning for that next phase of work. Uh, but we may not be able to respond to any specific detail of that because that work is ongoing. Um, if I move on now to the why, so this slide deals with that. Um, we know, um, and you may have seen it, there's been a lot of coverage uh, on, the, on the NHS in the media recently. So all of last week, you may have noticed the BBC was running its... Uh, a series of uh, series of programs. Um, we know our population is both growing and aging, um, and we know also that funding is not keeping pace with that growing demand. So, just in terms of some of the numbers, um, the CCG's funding is going up on an annual basis. Okay, so we're not seeing our funding cut. Uh, the growth in our allocation for the next two to three years is increasing by about two percent per annum. Uh, but what we also see is that the expected demand for healthcare services is going to increase in the region of 3 to 4% per annum. So that drives an affordability gap. Um, we, uh, we also believe that better prevention, as it says, will improve healthcare, uh, will improve health and reduce demand for those services. Um, we're able to identify a number and range of inequalities that exist across Oxfordshire. I think the example we've quoted in previous meetings that is within Oxford City, there is something like a, a, an eight-year difference in life expectancy between different wards in the city of Oxford. Okay. Um, and we strongly believe the, the quality and safety of care can be approved across a range of services. Um, buildings and equipment uh, need to be improved and addressed uh, for, to deliver better care. Uh, and we also know the current workforce model cannot meet the existing demand. So again, you may have picked up from the media that this is a national issue. Those national issues about workforce shortages across a, a number of key uh, specialisms uh, is also reflected in our, in our workforce in Oxfordshire. Okay, so this question's come up in, in probably all of the the five meetings we've had so far is questions around why are we doing the consultation in two phases and we accept that this might be uh, be confusing for the public um, but primarily the reasons are, are, are as on the slide so you know there first of all it's one it's an issue of scale so we could the the breadth and scope of the services we we hope to review and consult on uh, as such that we wouldn't be able to do it in one go Okay, from pure capacity reasons. Um, and then there are also a, a number of services that, that we believe need urgent changes. Okay, these are the ones that have been, um, been reviewed uh, and considered by HOSC already. So the acute hospital beds, um, we've, been, uh, we've been asked to consult them by, by the Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Also, in terms of there is some urgency around the temporary changes around maternity services at the Horton, and then also we believe there are clear uh, clinical quality and safety drivers for the proposed changes around critical care and stroke services. Um, and in addition to these, uh, we're also proposing a shift of what I called the planned care work uh, earlier. We've identified there's an opp opportunity to transfer much more of that work from Oxford to the Horton in the north of the county. So the proposals include around 90,000 um, appointments, attendances uh, across outpatients and day cases moving from Oxford to Banbury. Um, 
this is my final slide before I hand over to Julie and Dr. Julie Anderson, who's going to talk in a little bit more detail about the, uh, the, 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 the clinical proposals. Um, but overall, this is the CCG's vision for the future that's driving, that sits behind this, these consultation events on the work that we're doing. So um, we, we believe that you know, we, 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 you know, we, we want local access to diagnostics and expert advice. That's behind some of those proposals around the shifting work from, from, the, from the JR to the Horton. Uh, we want to prevent unnecessary admission to hospital or A&E wherever possible. Uh, we believe in using technology to support higher quality services. Uh, and we believe the best bed is your own bed uh, when you no longer need hospital care. And that's backed up by that, that point at the bottom of the slide there, uh, where evidence indicates that 10, 10 days in a hospital bed is equivalent to 10, year, 10 years of loss of muscle strength for the over 80s. Okay. If I hand over to Dr. Julie Anderson now. So good morning again. So I'm just going to uh, talk through about what this is actually going to mean uh, uh, on, on the ground. Um, first of all, using hospital beds differently. I've been a GP for nearly 35 years, and in that time, I have seen how uh, many changes. For example, people who used to have much longer lengths of stay in hospital after a procedure are now home within days. And that change has come about in the best interest of everyone because it was possible to do things differently. I think it's very analogous now when we're talking about actually people having care that they have traditionally been having in hospital for some of them to have it in the community. Um, for, for many elderly people, the conditions that they end up in hospital for are not in themselves complicated conditions. These are things like urine infections or chest infections. But what we know in elderly people is that they can become, uh, they can lose function very quickly when unwell. Um, so the the, what they really need is care while the antibiotics or whatever treatment is taking effect. And that can be done with supported nursing and the right care at home. But not only that, but also the access to diagnostics, which means that the d condition is diagnosed quickly and correctly, um, and the right technology, which means that there is uh, suitable support um, between specialists and community services. So... Um, we have already had some examples in uh, Oxfordshire and particularly in South West of doing things differently and some of you are probably aware of the Abingdon Emergency Medical Unit where um, patients who as a GP you would have normally had to um, refer to for an acute admission to the John Radcliffe can now be referred over to Abingdon emergency medical unit where they will have a same day assessment uh, the, the tests that they need are done on the same day with very quick results and they're then often home with some hospital at home nursing follow-up or review the next day in Abingdon so they they're never spending a night in hospital and this has actually uh, worked uh, very well for many people of course some do do still get referred from Abingdon to the John Radcliffe so it's based on clinical need and the video that I'm is now about to show is just talking a bit about this principle Mum had a, a bit of a fall from her chair. She has dementia and she's disabled. I picked her up off the floor and it looked as though she'd had a stroke. I called the ambulance and they decided that she needed the hospital. The Liaison Hub is a team of multi-professionals who are working together based at the hospital, but the most of their work is actually carried out in the care home beds across the county. Staying in hospital for the full extent of one's recovery is neither necessary nor desirable reducing exposure to uh, other people who are unwell, reducing exposure to infections by moving into a hub facility, increases the probability that someone's transition into wellness is going to continue without being broken up by the harms of being in a hospital environment. There's a huge psychological component to being cared for. Within three days, many particularly older or more vulnerable people, will become incontinent, 
whereas previously they weren't, just by virtue of having the availability of someone to look after your mo most basic needs. So by expediting a transition from being in a cared for hospital environment to a much more natural homely environment still within the support of a uh, nursing home or care home then we can make sure that we're avoiding that increased dependence which a lot of patients experience. We no longer see care as being a black or white division between pure hospital care until you're fully better and then discharged home. We don't like the idea of discharge. Radcliffe told me we managed to find you a bed in the nursing home that your wife's in. And I said, we well, just thought it would be good companionship for you, nice and simply together. And I very much enjoyed it there. I really did. I've seen really great results from people being enabled to get out of hospital, continue to have their rehabilitation and care, but in a setting that is much more homely. The liaison hub is a key component for ensuring that the whole system is using its capacity efficiently. I'm absolutely certain it's helping patients. The patients that I've worked with have really thrived. The liaison hub made such a difference to us because actually it got mum to the place that she really needs to be. I can't thank them enough. I'm really pleased with the way things went. So uh, that's an example of, uh, of where people are, um, patients can be transferred to more appropriate settings uh, and spend less time in hospital. And I was also talking about how uh, there are uh, ways in which patients can be uh, managed in the community rather than needing a, an acute hospital bed. So um, in order to make this change happen, obviously there needs to be some um, movement of resources and funding from hospital beds into community services and so the preferred option here is to ensure that people spend less time in hospital and more time closer to home where it's appropriate um, more investment in out of hospital care uh, and making sure people are in the right environment so moving on to planned care so that's the non-urgent care um, Although the next video that we're showing is mainly about services at the Horton, the principle applies across the, the county. Um, so uh, I'll summarise after that. Planned care is care that occurs outside of an emergency situation. And the three main components would be diagnostic tests, including imaging investigations such as CTs, X-rays and MRI tests, outpatient appointments and procedures that don't require to be performed as an emergency situation. Currently, a lot of patients have to travel to Oxford for various procedures and investigations. And if we could enhance the facilities within Banbury, then we could prevent those journeys from having to be made and try and deliver care to patients closer to their home. Looking at the catchment area of patients that travel to Oxford, it's projected that approximately 60,000 patients per year could be having their procedures and investigations in Banbury and not having to travel to Oxford for those investigations and procedures. To be able to deliver though, those services locally, we'd need to build a new state-of-the-art facility which would include um, diagnostics, outpatient facilities um, and improved uh, access to certain day case surgery and routine outpatient procedures. We already perform some chemotherapy and renal dialysis um, treatments in Banbury, but the plan is to enhance those facilities and increase access to more patients to be treated locally. Patients often have to attend hospital for several different appointments to have their investigations and their outpatient appointments. And and get their results at the end. So what we plan to do with a one-stop shop is to try and reduce the number of attendances patients would have to make. So although we're trying to deliver care locally to Banbury, we also want to reduce the number of appointments patients have to make to achieve their diagnosis and treatment. So again, although this is talking about Banbury, um, we uh, certainly as a GP I know very well that a number of people could be managed more effectively in the locality if we had more diagnostics although we do already have a range of diagnostic services but 
this, uh, with the Horton moving in this direction, I think there will be a, um, a it will be a model for doing that across the, the county. Um, and of course, if more people are managed up at the Horton, then there will be some capacity freed at the at the John Radcliffe. So moving on from there, um, specifically about stroke. Now, stroke's undergone a number of uh, changes of treatment over the years. Um, there's far more acute intervention that can be offered in the early stages, and that acute intervention is very important in terms of ensuring the best outcomes. Um, At present... So I'll just wait there for a minute. Um, the, um, the, the, the initial phases of the first, first few days of stroke, as I say, are, are critically important. But the other important thing for stroke recovery is having the right sort of rehabilitation. Um, although most stroke is hospital-based rehabilitation, be it in the acute hospital or community hospitals, there are a number of people in the uh, Oxford City and Bicester who have what we call an early supported discharge where therapists go to their home. Um, the studies that have been done on this alternative model have shown that on the whole the outcomes uh, are very much better for the patient. And we would like to extend this across the county so that it's equitable. In order to do this, then, again, services need to be moved from more uh, bed-based hospital services into community-based therapy-led services. Um, and this is a, a colleague who's talking about um, stroke care in the acute setting in the hospital. At present, we have an access uh, of all patients to the John Radcliffe for immediate assessment driven by four hours from onset. With the transformations that have have, have been undertaken in stroke care in the last 18 months or so where mechanical thrombectomy where we use devices to pull out clots rather than just using drugs we need to get patients to the John Radcliffe to enable equitable access from the whole county to this life-changing treatment this is a very intensive highly specialized intervention that very few centers in the whole of the UK can provide and we're very fortunate that we have one of those centres here in Oxford. We also need to provide equitable access to the rehabilitation that enables the best recovery for patients. Through the early supported discharge service, which we hope to expand from the six postcodes it currently covers to the whole county, we hope that we will enable patients to have therapy in the comfort of their own home, enabling them to have uh, therapy targeted and ensuring that they uh, maximise their chances of returning to functional independence in the environment where they're going to spend the rest of their lives. And that's the whole purpose of the, uh, the ESD being incorporated, early supported discharge, incorporated into this consultation. When it comes to immediate ask access to a hyperacute stroke unit, the major benefit to patients is the immediate assessment with specialist imaging and access to immediate specialist assessment by consultant staff, both physicians such as myself and my radiology colleagues, where we can make the immediate decision whether mechanical thrombectomy is potentially helpful to patients. This is a decision where uh, an immediate assessment and immediate decision really do uh, enhance the chances of um, patients returning back to how they were prior to their stroke. So at the moment, um, there are about 100-odd 100 100 people treated at the Horton Acute Stroke Unit. Um, probably uh, it will result in about 120, 150 more people being transferred from the Horton area to the um, Acute Stroke Unit at the John Radcliffe. Um, in, in exchange, there would be an early supported discharge service um, uh, throughout the county and um, people would be able to be repatriated early for rehabilitation at the Horton, so spending um, just the appropriate few days at the John Radcliffe and then getting back to their, uh, the Horton if they live in that locality. Critical care is what used to be called intensive care. Um, and... Um, at the moment, there's an intensive care unit at the Horton. Um, it's uh, divided into three levels of service, Tier 1, 2, and 3. 
and it's proposed that level three, which is basically people who need uh, ventilation and uh, a number of other supports, which is a highly technical area, to be transferred to the John Radcliffe, um, where the resources can be provided more uh, more appropriately. They already are, of course, provided. It stops the need to replicate these highly specialised skilled services in two sites. Um, the, the level three uh, intensive care at the Horton is a small number of people. Um, and because this relates specifically to the Horton and only a few people, and probably it was not going to affect anyone in this area, I'm going to skip over the video um, of this and move on to maternity. That summarises just what I've said. So, on the subject, we want to provide. So, on the subject of um, maternity, um, there's been about 1,500 deliveries a year for a while at the Horton. That's uh, about five a day. And nature is not so inefficient that actually most of those deliveries need doctors um, or specialist intervention. Of course, some do, um, and the highest risk pregnancies are already advised to deliver in the John Radcliffe. However, um, the 1,500 deliveries a year um, have until now required a, um, a specialist obstetrician to be on site at the John Radcliffe 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, and uh, along with that, there's also a need to have a special care baby unit. So... Uh, the staffing difficulties of actually recruiting those specialist staff to maintain a presence at the Horton have, have proved insurmountable and um, is already, as you will have known from the from publicity, uh, a need to make a decision to move all maternity, um, apart from the midwife-led unit, to the John Radcliffe. So this is partly on terms of practicalities, but also because if we're short as a country of obstetricians, I think it becomes self-evident that it um, is probably not making best use of those resources if uh, a, a specialist is tied up in the Horton for all that period of time for a relatively small number of deliveries. We want to provide a high-quality, safe and sustainable maternity service. And although we provide a great service at the moment that I'm very proud to work for and work in, we can still do better. And if you look at women of today, we have sort of two groups of women. We've got a much fitter, healthy group of low-risk women, and we've got women who have more complex pregnancies. And actually, we want to design, to, to design a new, to design or update our service so that women can get the best outcomes for themselves and their babies and their families. So to do this, we need to look at the service that we provide and how we can make it better, make it more sustainable and get the right women to go to the right teams. The most important um, element of care for women in pregnancy and during labour is about making sure that they've got the right information to make the right decision about where they have their care and by whom. So that would be done in partnership with, with the woman and also her uh, professional lead, which could be her midwife or, in, or her consultant obstetrician, depending on her pregnancy, um, and also her, her labour, her likely labour. So for women during um, the antenatal period, it's important that there's a risk assessment at the beginning of pregnancy to determine where, the, where they should have their care so it would be about the right place with the right team. Um, so if, you, if you've got a woman with a higher risk pregnancy, then there they would be um, a requirement for them to have um, medical input um, as well as care from their midwife. But if they've got a low risk pregnancy, then for the majority of the women, they will have their care with their community midwife uh, with some input from their general practitioner, which is also important. The main challenge in maternity is recruiting obstetric doctors. So to recruit doctors, we need to make the jobs attractive and we need to provide the doctors opportunities to train and to maintain their clinical skills. And currently, this is challenging, particularly in the smaller units. There's basically 
not enough clinical experience and clinical scenarios for the doctors to remain updated. Interestingly, there's a lot of information now and evidence that shows for these fit, healthy group of women, which, which, which most women are, they in fact do much better in low-risk uh, midwife-led units. There's less clinical intervention and they get a much better experience and get home quicker with their babies to their families. However, for some other women, their pregnancies are more complex. And actually, as the health service developed, we now find that these women, they do better if they're under the care of more specialist teams and have a different group or team of professionals looking after them. So, uh, as that video made clear, um, there's no evidence that um, women who... Uh, uh, delivering midwife-led units, even if during labour or following delivery they need to be transferred because of some complication arising to an obstetric unit, that there are any worse outcomes than if they're delivered in the obstetric unit to start with. Um, that's an important point because there's a, a feeling, I think, for some that the travel distances um, from the Horton to the John Radcliffe represent a, a risk to women and their babies. But, of course, for many people in this locality, especially around uh, further southwest, uh, you have very similar distances going to the, the, the John Radcliffe, and women have been delivering at Wallingford and Wantage uh, for many years. Um, so the proposal is to make permanent the closure of the obstetric unit at the Horton and turn it into a permanent midwife-led unit. Women in the north of the locality will have the option of receiving their specialist obstetric care at the John Radcliffe or at, over the border at Northampton in Warwick. Um, the special care baby unit would also transfer to the uh, John Radcliffe um, and some women who need emergency gynaecology service a surgery would be having it at the John Radcliffe. So that's the end of my bit running through the clinical areas. Over to you, Gail. Thank you very much. Um, who would like to start with a question to the panel? Yes, a lady with the brown uh, jacket on. Thank you. Just hold on. We'll get a microphone to you. Would you be kind enough to give us your name when you start as well? Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Linda Atkins. I'm a local county councillor and I worked for many years in the NHS. So I have sympathy with where you're at. But <clears throat> I also have some concerns. And in particular, the idea of increasing the capacity for elective activity at Banbury so that local people to Banbury can go there sounds great. Except that three years ago I had to have day surgery, something fairly minor. I chose to have an outpatient appointment at the John Radcliffe but was told at that appointment that the surgery would have to happen at the Horton. Now, it took me, well, it took my brother an hour and a half to drive me up there. He then had to hang around most of the day while I waited, because they put me at the end of the list, and then it was an hour and a half to get back. We weren't given any choice about that. We were just told that's where it is. And if you're having day surgery, you have to be driven by somebody else. You can't drive yourself. So that would be extremely disruptive for local people. And I just worry that if... It's all very well saying, oh, that'll free up some space at the JR. But if you're already sending people from here up to Banbury, why won't that increase? Um, um, why don't I uh, start answering on that? I mean, I, I, I understand the concern. I, I, I guess from the CCG's point of view, and we must remember it's their consultation, um, what they'll be saying is we need something that is safe and sustainable and fair for all the population of Oxfordshire. So I guess there is inevitably a potential piece of that conversation that says if we're making people from Banbury come to Oxford for some bits of their treatment, it might be possible that we'd be asking some people from the, the kind of um, north of the south to go to Banbury for bits of their treatment, provided there was a compelling reason for that. Now, compelling reasons for that might include the fact that there's a real opportunity to develop a centre of excellence in Banbury in things like day surgery and diagnostic imaging and all the rest of it, so that, in fact, it might be a place that's rather pleasant to go to. Banbury doesn't have quite the same problems of congestion and parking that have been all over the news uh, for us recently, 
although I'm pleased to be able to tell people, and Peter may say more as he's now responsible for, for the major estates uh, planning, that um, there does seem to be some progress in discussions about ways to improve parking and flow at the John Radcliffe. But I suppose what I want to reassure you is there's not a prior intention on the part of the trust to suddenly say that the folk who live in Didcot would need to travel to Banbury to get treatment. Um, I agree, that doesn't seem entirely logical. But as I say, if it turns out that Banbury, because there's space and opportunity, is a fantastic place to develop a, a day uh, centre for some other particular intervention where, you know, in, in the same sense as stroke, critical mass and concentration of expertise allows for fantastic experience and outcomes, then people might take a different view that that's worth the travel. It's not the trust's intention to make lots of people from South Oxfordshire travel to Banbury for treatment. Can I, can uh, Julie, come can in I add that? to that? I mean, as, as a GP in the South, I've also had patients who've had the, exactly the same problem that you've <coughs> outlined, um, and I uh, can share their frustration. Um, I think that the, that was around a, a couple of very specific areas, and I, it's certainly not the intention of the CCG either that um, the, all planned care would move up to the, the, the Horton and that, that people in the south of the county would be expected to go there. What, I'm as, uh, what I think we're envisaging is that apart from maybe some very small um, settings where, uh, as Tony was just talking about, I think that most people would have the choice of going to either the Horton or the John Radcliffe and could choose accordingly. Um, there's already a, a choice around where you receive your care, um, but it's not uh, going to be a wholesale transfer of all uh, elective care up to the Horton. There would, that would still be available in the John Radcliffe. Just picking up the car parking point and the access to um, the hospitals, particularly in Oxford, um, it's very clear that the congestion happens. Uh, everybody knows that and everybody is warned with their outpatient letters or their uh, inpatient letters um, if they're coming in for planned surgery to come early. Um, one of the key things that we're doing is working with uh, the county council particularly uh, on what's called the master planning process. And what that is about is trying to work out what the development of the sites we have in Oxford. So we've got three sites. We've got the Knock, the Churchill, and the Radcliffe. And the idea is to get a better flow of both cars and patients through that process and address the car parking issues. Um, we're doing exactly the same in Banbury because that's part of the overall strategy for the Oxford area. Um, and I think it, it, the good news is that we are working with also both <coughs> Oxford Health, um, who've got similar issues in the Warmford Hospital, as an example, um, as well as the universities of, as a major employer of the area. So actually working collaboratively to try and resolve those issues is very helpful. And we've got a master plan process that will happen in March, and that will start a process of consultation off on how we look at those flows of both cars, people, and, uh, and services. Okay. Does that help? <laughs> okay, any <laughs> Okay. Has anyone else got a similar question? The lady just there with the black and white cardigan. Hello, my name is Deborah Stevens. I'm a local resident and I uh, don't know how much you are aware of the proposals for development around Didcot North so in Wallingford. There's a lot of um, houses proposed to be built and there will be increasing demand for services. Um I'd be grateful to know what sort of timescales your master planning is going to be looking at and how you'll be taking that into account. Okay, so your concern is the increasing number of people who are going to come and live here with the houses being built yeah. and the time frame. Yes. Okay. So, yes, I'm very aware of that issue, um, and the CCG is actively working with the uh, planning department of the council to try and ensure that the needs of the health needs of the population are going to be addressed within all this development so that's going to cover primary care uh, and uh, and of course in the second part of the consultation which will focus on our, the community estates and community hospitals um, there will be a need to address within that consultation how services need to change in order to meet the the, the need for more out-of-hospital care um, and, and the increased numbers of people who needing care. So, yes, it's very much on the radar. There are active conversations going on, um, and certainly within primary care, which is the initial um, um, need. So we recognise that we need a new practice in Didcot um, within 
the next couple of years and sites are actively being sought to make that happen. Um, the, all the add-on services, the community services, the diagnostics, that will be fed into the second part of the consultation. Peter. Just on the master planning process, in essence, it's looking at the five-year, what's an immediate thing that we need to do? <coughs> the 25-year, what do we need to do sort of in the medium term? And then the 40-year sort of plan of what we need to do uh, longer term. Um, because uh, the NHS bills organize uh, sort of hospitals for 60-year occupancy. And actually, you know, that might not be the ideal design for the future. So we need to work in those three chunks of, 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 of how we need to plan our estate effectively. Okay, thank you. Other questions, please? Yes, gentlemen there. we we'll just get the microphone to you. Uh, Robert Stocks, following on uh, from that, um, a lot of the developments uh, referred to in Round Didcot have already taken place. And we've become concerned that uh, within those developments, the health service does not appear to have applied for any uh, funding from within them, like Section 106 or CIL funding, and the opportunity already seems to have been missed. Have you any comments? Um, so th within the Great Western Park development, there is uh, land allocated under Section 106 funding for a health centre. I think in consultation with the practices and the CCG and the planners, we felt that that wasn't going to provide a large enough uh, practice for the future, especially bearing in mind the other developments like Valley Park and Milton Heights, etc. Um, we've been working closely with the local three local practices in Didcot to check on how how they feel they can manage the increased capacity that's happening at the moment, um, and uh, they have been able to uh, take on this extra capacity for the time being. But we know that, as I say, there will be a need for a new practice. Um, Woodlands practice, for example, is already actively expanding at the moment with an extension. So we're in close touch with the practices. There is Section 106 funding in Great Western Park, but we have an ambition to, uh, and we've been discussing it with the planners, about making a larger single primary care site that will take care of the needs of both uh, Great Western Park and Valley Park and the associated housing growth. Um, so that's, that's actively happening. Um, with the Valley Park development, um, we, we are going to, uh, again, try and ensure that the 106 funding for health care is, uh, is there and added into the Great Western uh, Park to make a single site. Okay. Anyone else have any other questions around that issue? Yeah. No? Okay. Any other questions? Oh, so the existing practices have indicated that they think they will run out of capacity by 2019. We are collecting data from them quarterly in order to make sure that that's not inaccurate. What, one of the challenges in all of this is that um, planning permission is given for, you know, X hundred houses, but it doesn't mean that X hundred houses are going to go up. And uh, as we seem to, what we seem to be seeing is that the, pla the builders build 150 houses at a time and then sell them and then build another 150. So the timeline of that is quite difficult. And so we have felt that the housing growth and the population growth has not been quite as precipitous as it might have been if all the houses were built at once. But all we can do is watch very carefully, um, liaise very carefully, and get our plans ready for something being ready in place for 2019. Okay. Other questions, please? Yes, a gentleman there. Hello. <clears throat> I'm Peter Ree. I live in East Street here at Didcot. I was a carer for uh, my mother-in-law for six years, myself and my wife. Uh, and we had, I wanted to raise the question of how much support you give for people who care for disabled uh, at home. Uh, at the time we did this, uh, there was a system called Anchor Staying Putt, which enabled us to modify a WC to be a wet room. And also we had received, I think, uh, £200 uh, a month uh, grant, of, uh, and I wondered whether or not you were looking at supporting caring at home as a, a major support system. Okay, thank you, Gareth. 
Um, so I don't have um, all the details at hand, so, I, so we can respond to you uh, outside of this and put the answer on the website. But what I do know is uh, I think we've just finished a joint consultation exercise with Oxfordshire County Council, specifically around carers and carer support services. Um, so I think as a result of that, we together we plan to make changes, but hopefully the purpose of that consultation exercise was to better use the resources we've got to support carers together. So I think as a result of that, there will be there are a number of changes proposed, and again, I've said we can, we, we can respond separately with what those are. But then also I think um, that has released some money, I think, specifically for the CCG uh, and uh, working with GPs to specifically target support services for carers. Can I, can I just add to that, though? That, I mean, I think it's fair to say that, if, that if, if we don't have more of what you and your wife have been doing, um, you know, then all of these plans will, will struggle to work, I think. You know, we are looking at larger numbers of more dependent older people. Um, we're also looking at large numbers of independent older people as well. But that whole issue about care is a really important one. Um, I think part of why I see these arguments around releasing hospital beds and helping move some resource into the community is because whether we like it or not, we have got a workforce issue and we suspect that Brexit will make that more difficult in the short term. Um, and we have to make the best use of the resources and in that sense, the skills and the people as we can. Um, but I think that kind of idea of professional support and carers has absolutely got to go hand in hand with people who, like you, take on that responsibility and that caring. And I do think we need to be better and more imaginative about how to support folk like you, you know, in, in more ways than, than just with money, as it were, but with, with skills and with contact and with, uh, you know, the kind of psychological support, because it's hard work, that kind of thing, and the responsibility is huge. But as a society, I think we will have to take more of it back and, and more of it away from um, people we think we can hire to do it for us, because I think they're, they're simply not out there in the numbers that we'll need. And that's a difficult message for us all, I think. So thank you for raising that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the lady over there, thank you. Well, I support Carer's Voice. And I just want to reiterate what the gentleman said, and I was glad to hear what you were saying, but there is an enormous risk in all this because from our perspective, there is a clear, total mismatch and lack of connection between health and social care because this is quite logical on one hand and on the other hand you've got the enormous risk of the lack of clinical skills within the community which is why so many people end up in hospital anyway and the burden on unpaid carers and family members at a time when the county council is reducing support to carers despite the care act you know we haven't even got a kind of strategic carer's strategy going. Um, it is really, really lacking that join up between this and social care. And it would be great to hear much more about the risk prevention um, when people are talking, because carers are feeling increasingly vulnerable. You know, lunch clubs closing, community support closing. Yes, there's an opportunity in different ways of doing things. But there's also a real feeling of isolation and vulnerability. Okay, what's your biggest concern? Lack of support, lack of clinical expertise in the community for various reasons, and this is not blaming anyone. So lack of clinical expertise in a timely way in the community to prevent that hospital admission and reducing support to carers. Okay, thank you. Yes, I mean, I think that the, um, you know, as, as we evolve, then we will need to have fairly imaginative solutions to these problems. Um, and it may be that within certain areas that actually it would make sense for the health service to employ some carers, if that's the thing that is needed. However, sure, okay. And, and I, I refer to my colleagues' remarks about how we can best support the the large army of unpaid volunteers out there. All I can say is that we recognise the need 
um, and will you know, be trying to, as we change resources from hospital-based care to community care, that is one of the things that needs to, to happen. So it's recognised, it's on the agenda. Okay, let's bring Peter in. So I think this is a really important area of concern, and certainly um, when I was in my previous job, which was looking at research and development across the system, um, one of the things that came out of it was isolation, which is the thing you, you picked up. And actually, there's a lot of good work going on around the digital adoption and having interventions which help so people feel less isolated in their own homes. And I think part of the work that we're going to be doing, particularly in the uh, work from uh, the sort of community and, and hospital base, is to try and make that much more connected in. And whether that's through an iPad or whatever, it, you know, it's just a mechanism. It's a mechanism, not the mechanism that will solve the problem. But at least getting that type of digital technology available will help in this way. It won't solve all the problems, but it will start to make sure there's more connection for people generally. Can, can I just add to that, you know, which is, I mean, there's not an immediate answer to your question, but, or because if there was, you wouldn't be asking the question. Yeah. Um, but to give you an example of some of the things, I think, that show us the direction of travel and the progress we're making, you saw the, the little movie clip about the liaison hub and how that works. That is a collaboration between colleagues in Oxford Health and in social care, as well as with the hospital. And that has involved the development of what we call intermediate care beds in the nursing home sector. Those are beds where we provide in-reach of clinical expertise into those nursing homes together with physio work. You saw a physiotherapist on the, on the film. Um, and what I think has been really interesting has been how that has helped the hospital to understand how many decent nursing homes and care homes there are actually. We have an assumption because we hear about catastrophes in the media that they're all awful places. It's very clear that many of them are being run by very motivated people who really want to provide great quality of care for people you know, towards the end of their lives. And what's been interesting is those staff have been very keen to be supported by the colleagues from Oxford Health and, and our trust to increase their skills. And I would see that as a model that wouldn't necessarily have to stop with people working in, in care homes if we together chose that to, you know, to be the right way forward. Um, so I do think we've got the sort of, you know, the, the, the evidence of what is possible if we do work together on this project of, of really pushing the support as far out of the hospital as, as we can. You know, and there are, there are other initiatives that we're hoping to get going you know, that, that are borrowed from other parts of the country where there's terrific support, for example, to people caring for relatives at the very end of their lives where there's a plan for them to die at home, but where we know that often goes wrong at the very end because the final moments can be pretty unpleasant and everyone gets in a panic uh, and without the right support, all you can do is call the ambulance and, and take the person to hospital, usually to die within, within a few hours or a day of arriving, which we know is a terrible thing to happen. But, but you know, what, what we've uh, you know, been able to find is that in, in some parts of the country, you know, there are ways of providing both you know, advice by phone and very immediate support to help get through that kind of final moment of crisis and to, to meet the, the planned wishes of the dying person and the family. So I think these are examples of what we can work towards. Um, but I completely agree with you. If we don't support carers and families and make them feel that this is a safe thing to do, then obviously people will just feel more worried. For me, it's about getting away from the idea that putting someone in a hospital bed and keeping them there is the best thing you can do for them. And I think what we've come to realise is it's only the best thing while they're so ill that they need the special things in hospital. As soon as they're better enough to start needing to move around and be looked after in a rather simple convalescent kind of way, it becomes a bad thing with more risk of falling, of getting infections, of getting confused, of, you know, all of those sorts of, of unpleasantnesses of being in, a, in an uncontrolled environment uh, surrounded by strangers and, it, and clearly much better to be in your own home provided there's the sense of safety and the, and the reality of it. Okay. We'll take a couple more questions and then we'll break into the round table so you can ask more specific questions and also give the panel your feedback. Is there anyone else who wants to ask another question before we do that? Yes, sir. I'm Brian Goldthorpe. I'm the uh, public chair of the OCCG's 
Quality Reference Group. Um, in, in dealing with particularly uh, patients in some of the protected group, their thinking about these changes that you're talking about is driven dominantly by financial considerations, that it's uh, cost-saving, whatever. How are you going to, as you move with these strategic moves that are going to affect a lot of people, how are you going to ensure that what we all believe is the fundamental uh, issue as far as their health care is concerned, that patient safety experience, but more particularly outcomes, patient outcomes, are the guiding thing for doing anything. How are you going to make sure, as you go along, that this actually is working out in the way that will uh, lead to this success in this area, and not just to saving lots of money? Yeah, well, I think that's a great question. And I, I suppose what I'd say is I think in, increasingly in the hospital sector, we're very used to looking at uh, safety events and outcomes, and there's a lot of emphasis on that and, and many different kinds of outcomes that are nationally published. In the primary care sector, Julian colleagues are very used to looking at, at, at other kinds of outcomes, outcomes frameworks linked to monitoring of people with diabetes or blood pressure, for example. But I think there's a real opportunity as we try to kind of rejoin these two elements of care, and particularly with the, the digital stuff that Peter's so responsible for, to actually really take a bit of a step change on that so that people who are in primary care are having their outcomes measured and looked at in ways that are not burdensome for the GP or the primary care team to do. And in the same sense, you know, when they come through into hospitals, you know, we're able to, to track how that works. And I'm absolutely convinced that that will happen and will be able to happen. Um, I do think you know, we've, we're just at the very beginning of understanding how to make the information easily accessible so that we can actually see what's going on um, you know, and be able to respond to that much better. Um, I got a sense from your question that you don't necessarily think it's all driven by money. I certainly don't. There is a big problem with money, and we all know that without money we can't do the things we want to do. So there's a kind of realism about you know, if the money isn't going to increase the way we want it to, we need to do something different. But I really do think, you know, when we look at systems internationally that very successfully deliver great outcomes for minimal, minimal spend, Yongshaping County in Sweden is greatly quoted in this. Uh, some of the systems in some, some of the parts of America where you wouldn't mind being looked after, I'm not talking about the whole American healthcare system, but there are some subsystems, Kaiser Permanente and others, that deliver really good outcomes for um, smaller amounts of money than we are spending. So we know there are ways to do this, and it's about borrowing those good bits from other places to, uh, to deliver that. Peter, do you want to talk more about yes, information? Yes, yeah. you're right about the outcomes side of the equation, because outcomes are very hard to measure most of the time when you don't have the right bits of data. I think the, the really good thing that we've got in the next couple of years is an acceleration of our information that we gather. So GPs have very good data. Uh, the hospital is building very good data sets now. Um, the community are building data sets, and we're going to connect those together so then you can see the full outcome for the patient. And that allows us then to look at proper cohorts of individual groups of patients, so people with diabetes, COPD, um, all the sort of long-term condition type um, uh, areas. And that will allow us to make sure we optimize the sort of the pathway of care for that individual patient. And I think, you know, we're at the, the precipice of being able to do that right now. Um, you know, we couldn't have done that years ago. Um, and it's the building blocks that have been put in place both at the hospital, in the, the primary care, and also in the community that are allowing that to happen. Um, I've done a lot of work internationally with outcome data, um, and that's, that's proven that you can actually get very good correlations between what is a good care pathway and a good outcome for the patient and at the end of the day this is all about individual patients not just the population as a whole and each patient is individual and therefore wants the best pathway for the, that individual patient 
Okay, Julie. Can I just add to that? I mean, I think we're already in primary care. We collect an awful lot of process and outcome data. We're obliged to, um, and because we've been computerised for so long, it's all there. Um, one of the things that is uh, routinely collected, though, is uh, it, it, both in hospital systems and primary care, is, is where someone ends their life. And we know that, actually, if you... For most people, when asked, they want to die at home if they know they're going to die. And um, that's, surveys have shown that's about 80%. But we know that actually 50% of people also are still dying in hospital. So we know that actually on that outcome, we're not getting it right. And again, as a GP looking after patients in a nursing home, where we did proactively ask them and record this information, and that still happens, you know, it's a routine thing on a, a, a digital advanced care plan digital in the sense that it's in the patient computer record but it's also in paper form in the nursing home and is known to the other relevant services that time and again we hear of instances where people are being taken to hospital because of some urgent problem cropping up when there's a clear plan where the ceiling of care has it was being the nursing home to be kept comfortable in the nursing home so so there's there's those sorts of things actually need to be put right, and I think these changes are ways of helping us do that. Okay. Gareth. So I think, I think what's also in your question is, is the point about change. So, so how can we ensure that whatever we change has the desired impacts and also manages any adverse impacts? So it's a more focused example, but in terms of the, the temporary closure of the obstetric services uh, at the Horton, uh, there are specific monitoring arrangements being put in place and that, uh, so, and a suite of metrics uh, that are looking at both outcomes and about risk management. So I think it's that kind of model we would use to, to monitor and track any, of, any changes that we propose. Peter, you want to come back on Just, that? It's a, a very good point, Gareth, because I think the, um, when we look at the delayed transfer to care programme and the work we've done around that, and we've done sampling of people who've uh, gone through that process, the, the, the quality of what they uh, experience and how they want to get back to their home as quickly as possible has been really positive. So that's initial soundings in terms of what we've learned, but actually moving people to their own home has shown positive benefits for their recovery. Okay, thank you. On each of your tables, there should be... If you don't get your question answered in the round table, we'll come back to it at the end. On each of the tables, there should be one of these, which has got a number of questions. People want to uh, have a look at those questions. You've got someone from the NHS, representing the NHS, on the table. They're going to write down the main points that you want to get across. So we've got till 12... Um, Take the, make the most of it. You've got people here that you can ask. And the panel will come round as well. And if you don't get your question answered, come back to me at the end. All right. Thank you very much. Right. OK, ladies and gentlemen, we'll start to wrap up now. The NHS representative on your table will have made notes which we will then make sure the most frequently asked questions are the answers and the most frequently asked questions are put on the website. The public consultations like this are not the only way you can take part. So if you know people who haven't been able to get here today, please do encourage them to go to the website, uh, make their feelings known. There's a questionnaire on the website. There's also a paper copy uh, if you haven't got one, then there will be one you can collect over at the door. I'll just go and get one very quickly to show you which one I mean. So please grab one of those, um, one of those ones, please, if you haven't got one. Um, and also you can, of course, write using the free post address. So thank you all very much for coming today. Thank you.